Um, I only have about 10 different slides for you today. Um, and I tried to keep this general. I'm sure that there are plenty of you who are listening in today who have done genetic counseling or are scheduled for it, may or may not have done genetic testing, may or may not have ever had cancer. I'm sure it's a varied group. So I'm hoping that everybody can find a little bit um, that's helpful to them um, in this presentation. Um, I like to start out with the basics, just introducing the concept of what is the gene and how genes um, have to do with cancer. Um, cancer is ultimately caused by changes, otherwise known as mutations in genes that control the way that cells work, grow, and divide. And genes are basically our cells' instruction manuals. Um, when the gene is correct, that means the instructions are correct, and the cell behaves and works the way that it should. But if all of a sudden there's a problem with the instructions or a mutation in a gene, these cells can become abnormal. They begin to divide without stopping. They can form a tumor. They could invade normal tissue and they could spread to other areas. So it's technically mutations in genes that ultimately cause cancer. But then what causes these mutations? Sometimes we never really know what causes these genetic mutations that cause a cancer. Sometimes it could just be random chance. Cells are dividing, the genetic code is being duplicated, and just random errors can be incorporated that have significant implications for our health. Um, one issue with cancer is increasing age. The older we get, just, you know, the more likely we are to have a mutation um, that happens to us that increases the risk for cancer. And then also our environment and what we're exposed to throughout our life. Um, classic examples, um, not meaning to pinpoint anyone in particular, but, you know, examples that you might know of, things like, you know, cigarette smoking and lung cancer or um, prolonged sun exposure and um, skin cancer, those kinds of things. But in general, these sporadic genetic mutations that can happen over the course of our lifetime cause the majority of cancers that develop. Um, however, this talk is about hereditary breast cancer. So I want to bring this home to the idea that only a minority of cancer is technically hereditary. If you see my little pie here, sporadic or familial cancers probably account for about 90% of all cancers, and hereditary cancers are about 10%. Now, that can certainly vary based on the cancer type. And since we're talking about hereditary breast cancer, I'll give you an idea of, in general, what I mean by that for female cancers. For instance, while 10% is a good average to think of, with, say, ovarian cancer, it may be more like 20%. Um, breast and uterine might be more like 7 to 10%, and cervical is rarely hereditary. So every different cancer type has its own percent, which is hereditary, but in general, we think about a 90-10 split. With sporadic cancers, like I said before, these are cancers that are happening just because of gene mutations that happen during the course of our life and cause cancer. We might see more cancer in a family than we expect based on chance, and that could just be due to the fact that family members just may share a lot of common risk factors, you know, the kind of work that they do or the kinds of things that they're exposed to. But hereditary cancer is a little bit different. Um, it's the idea that we inherit a particular gene mutation that is present, now present from birth, it's present in all the cells of our body, and its presence increases the risk for cancer for that person and that family. The idea behind this is we actually have genes that are responsible for protecting us against cancer. They're not perfect. People get cancer anyway. But in general, we want all of these protection genes working to try to keep ourselves healthy. When these random mutations happen, those genes can fix those mutations. When they don't quite fix the mutation in the beginning, maybe those genes can stop the cancer process before it becomes a clinical issue. So we want these particular cancer protection genes to be working. But if there is an inherited mutation in one of those key protection genes, it means that copy of that gene isn't contributing to the protection. So that person, and therefore that family, 
has less protection compared to other people against the genetic mutations that happen during our lifetime. And that's what increases the risk for cancer. A lot of people say, well, I wanna know if I have the gene. Well, we all have these genes. We just want them to be working. So that's sort of the idea behind this. Another way to look at it is the idea of what are these mutations that we're talking about? In sporadic garden variety cancers, if you looked in the tumor cells, so for breast cancer, if you looked in a breast tumor, you would see mutations. Of course you'd see mutations. This is abnormal tissue, and remember, all cancer has to do with genetic mutations. But if you actually do testing and you look at the mutations in that tumor, those are mutations that are specific to that tumor. They happened in that tumor process. And so the information about those mutations really gives the doctors and nurses information for how to treat that cancer or that patient only. It really has no implications for the family because it's specific to that tumor. And a lot of times when you hear about personalized medicine or precision medicine for cancer, that's what they're talking about, looking at sort of a genetic signature of the tumor and seeing what's going on in that tumor and maybe tailoring um, treatment to what they see. As opposed to that, with hereditary cancer, that would be where there would be a genetic mutation, a particular one present in every cell in the body, skin cells, blood cells, brain cells, everywhere, including the eggs or sperm that we have that we can then um, use to pass something on to the next generation. I'll also note that because hereditary mutations are present in every cell of the body, technically they're also present in the tumor cells. But if there is an inherited mutation in a tumor cell, it's not like it raises its hand and says, hey, I'm the hereditary one. But sometimes there are clues that um, genetic folks can use to try to figure out which ones those are or do some genetic testing to try to tease that out. But the difference here also is with hereditary cancer, if you know what that mutation is, not only can you use that information potentially to impact cancer treatment, including breast cancer, but it also impacts what we know about um, risks for a person for you know, cancer down the road or for a family. So it's a little bit different. So why do we bother to diagnose hereditary breast cancer? Because we want to understand why a breast cancer has happened for ourselves, for our family. Um, we want that information to maybe guide our medical care to make sure that we're being taken care of the best way that is possible based on all available information. We want to know a little bit more about what is our risk for a future cancer, and it could be more than just breast cancer risk. And we also often want that information for family. So when a genetic counselor takes a family history, we are looking for clues because how do you know when it's hereditary breast cancer? Now, what I have on the screen, they're just, they're signs. If anybody has any one of these, it doesn't mean necessarily that they have hereditary breast cancer. But as a group, these are some of the things that we are looking for. Things like, and I'll start from the top left, breast cancer diagnosed in an individual a little younger than you expect. If the average age of a breast cancer diagnosis is in someone 16, you know, 50 or under, we'll pay a little closer attention. With a triple negative pathology of a breast cancer, and some of you may have heard that term before, the threshold is a little higher because this triple negative pathology may be a, a more associated with hereditary cancer risk. Um, and so we would look at someone with a triple negative breast cancer at or under age 60, so a little higher threshold for age. We also look to see if someone's had multiple primary cancers. The idea that having cancer once, well, okay, but having cancer twice or three times, maybe there was inherited risk there. And what I mean by multiple primary or separate cancers is, you know, say a cancer in one breast and then the other, or maybe two complete separate tumors in the same breast, or maybe breast cancer and another cancer in a whole other different organ. I'm not talking about cancer spreading, but separate cancers. Another thing we look at is breast cancer in men. It happens. We don't hear about it very often. 
the risk for the general population male to get a breast cancer is definitely less than 1%. So when a man gets a breast cancer, you know, naturally we think, could there be an inherited component? But still, interestingly, probably only about 10% of men who get breast cancer have an inherited mutation. So it's still fairly similar for female and male breast cancer in terms of percentage. But if a man gets breast cancer, we entertain the notion that it's hereditary. And like I said before, sometimes genetic test results for a tumor might suggest an inherited mutation. I'll give you an example just from the other day in clinic. We found that a person in the cancer center who had been diagnosed with two totally separate cancers had tumor testing, tumor genetic testing done, and was found to have the exact same mutation in the exact same gene in both cancers. We don't know yet if that's inherited, but we're checking that out. So that gives you an example. Also, the idea that when you start to see multiple blood relatives with breast cancer in the family, especially if some of those individuals will, were diagnosed at relatively younger ages, that makes us you know, sit up and, and wonder, is there an inherited component? But it doesn't just have to be breast cancer. When there are multiple blood relatives with breast and potentially other cancer types, that can be a red flag. Things like you know, prostate, ovarian, pancreas, or other cancers. Um, also, the idea of Eastern European or Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry and breast cancer. We do know that people of that ancestry who have breast cancer have a little higher chance than others with breast cancer to have specific what they call founder mutations or population common mutations um, in the BRCA1 and 2 genes, which are the two most common genes that cause hereditary breast cancer. So again, these, this is not an exhaustive list, but it sort of gives you an idea of what are we looking for when we're thinking that the, that the breast cancer in a person or a family might be hereditary versus just sporadic. So how do we diagnose hereditary breast cancer? Way back in the day, when we didn't have gene testing, all we could do was make a clinical diagnosis. So you'll see on the left of the screen, sort of a family tree or a pedigree, as we call it. Circles represent females. Males, rep I'm sorry, squares represent males. And you can see the general generation lines up at the top would be the grandparents, next line down would be their kids, and the next line down would be their, um, their grandkids. And any um, circle or square that's filled in represents a cancer. And I literally made this up just to show what a stereotypical hereditary breast cancer family might look like. For instance, the woman um, in the first generation has cancer in both breasts at relatively young ages. Of her three children, one doesn't have cancer. Um, her son has prostate cancer at a smidge early age, and her daughter had breast cancer again at a little younger age. And then that woman in turn had several children. Not everybody, not all the kids had cancer, but somebody with breast at a younger age, somebody with ovarian, just to give you an idea of what this might look like. But I have to say that these gene mutations do not read the textbooks. We see family histories where we get surprised. Um, you know, so there's a lot of different things. But this sort of shows you that technically you can make a clinical diagnosis, that it's looking like hereditary breast cancer. A more definitive way to diagnose it, though, is to go through genetic testing. Um, we in the Cancer Genetics Program are big proponents of pre-test genetic counseling family history, discussion, patient education, making sure that people understand the ins and the outs of the testing, as well as making sure that the most appropriate test is being considered for the family history. Um, we go through informed consent if a person decides to go ahead with testing. The testing is done on healthy cells. So this kind of testing is done on typically a blood sample or a saliva sample, but sometimes we could use cheek cells or skin cells. It kind of depends. But again, not tumor cells, because that's different. And then if we find a mutation in a hereditary breast cancer syndrome gene, then we know that there was um, this syndrome identified and we have a genetic test diagnosis that probably goes hand in hand with the clinical diagnosis. So what are the different types of genetic testing for hereditary breast cancer? And again, I'm talking about healthy cells, not the tumor cells. Really three specific types. Um, at the bottom, um, site-specific testing. When you know that there's a mutation in a family member, 
you could be tested specifically for that mutation. And that can be very appropriate. However, we as genetic counselors always look at the opposite side of the family to make sure we're not missing something. For example, say someone comes in and on their mom's side of the family, we know that there's a mutation in the BRCA2 gene. So of course, you'd wanna test specifically for that mutation. But what if we sit down and we ask about that person's father's side of the family and we see that that person's grandmother and several aunts all had a female cancer too, might we wanna expand the testing? So that brings me to the next point. If you go up the slide a little bit, um, there can be single gene or single syndrome testing. And that's the idea that you might test an entire gene or an entire gene, or I'm sorry, entire multiple genes. But that's a very small targeted test when you have a high level of confidence that you know what gene or small group of genes you think are really the issue. More often these days um, in clinic, we order what's called multi-gene panel testing. It's more comprehensive. It looks at lots of genes that have to do with hereditary breast cancer. It can also, you can sort of mix and match. You have the ability to do that with a single sample. You could say, well, based on the family history, I wanna look at a lot of these genes that have to do with say, hereditary breast cancer and hereditary colon, or hereditary breast and hereditary gynecologic. Or you can actually do a big mashup where you're looking at lots of different genes that have to do with lots of different cancer types. That would be things like breast, gynecologic, colon, pancreas, prostate, skin, you see how that can just balloon. So there's a lot of variety in the testing that could be done for a person or a family depending on what's appropriate and that person's goals for the testing. Just to give you an idea, when you do one of these broad-based approaches, the genes are not all the same with regard to breast or other cancer risks. Some of these genes have a pretty high lifetime risk of a particular cancer. If we're talking about breast cancer, high lifetime risk of breast cancer, we usually talk about 40 to 90% lifetime risk. Notice I didn't say 100, um, but that's pretty high. There are some genes that only convey a quote unquote moderate increased risk over the course of a lifetime, and that might be more like 20 to 40%. Some genes where we think the risk is increased, we're still not sure what that risk is, and it may still be below 20%. Um, to all that compared to the general population risk, which is probably somewhere around 8% or so, um, 8, 12, somewhere in there, but obviously not. 20, 40, 80, 90, you know, those kinds of numbers that we're talking about. And the higher the risk is for breast cancer associated with that gene, the better our information is with regard to treatment and cancer screening um, because we know a little bit more about those genes and the cancer risks for people. I promise we're almost done. Um, this is a slide just to show you different examples of genes that we are currently testing for hereditary breast cancer. And I organized this from top to bottom. The genes at the top in the darkest gray shading are typically the ones that we think about that convey the highest risk for breast cancer. Remember I was talking about that 40 to 90% lifetime risk range? Those are those genes. Then as you start to go down, you know, lighter gray, you start to get into the more moderate risk genes, or for instance, NBN, we're still going mutation by mutation trying to figure out is there really increased risk? And the genes towards the bottom of the list, they're the ones where if there's an increased risk for breast cancer, it's probably not that high, um, and we're still trying to tease some of those out. But another point to make with this slide is if you look from left to right, you can see for a lot of these genes that they don't just increase the risk for breast cancer, they often increase the risk for other types of cancers. Now, the cancer risks for other cancer types may not be the same level as breast cancer. Um, so there's a lot of variety with these genes, but this also shows you how there's a lot of overlap here with these genes and why it would make sense now when I said that when you look at a family history and you're worried about hereditary breast cancer, you have to look at what the other cancer types are in the family if there is um, a family history of other cancer types. And then last slide, so when you do this genetic testing, what are the results? Well, they can be positive or negative or uncertain. And I lump negative and uncertain together because 
if there's a change in a gene that we just don't know what that change means yet, we don't call it a mutation, we don't call it normal, um, but we treat it like a negative result because clinically, most of those uncertain results over time, we figure out are really negative. So when there is a negative result, we don't change someone's medical care based on the genetic result, but we do look to their personal risk factors and family history to guide them. But if there's a positive result, and this is where I'm gonna um, uh, come to Dr. Dragan, you can hopefully use that information that now you know that there's hereditary breast cancer, there's a mutation in the gene, other people in the family, usually adults, unless there's medical necessity, can be tested, and that person's medical care might change. If they're dealing with cancer, it may change their cancer treatment. If they are looking ahead for how best to be screened for cancer, there may be different things they can do compared to what they're already doing, and there may be ways to reduce the risk for cancer. It could just be as simple as lifestyle changes or reducing um, exposures, but also there might be surgeries or medications. So there are different things that every woman can work with their medical team to figure out what's right for them based on their goals, their needs, their age, what's going on in their life. It can be very customized. So that is it from my half, and I wanted to punt over to Dr. Dragan so that he can take this and sort of move forward um, from the medical perspective. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Kristen. Um, we, uh, right now, uh, with that handoff and that introduction to um, cancer genetics overall, uh, I'd like to take that and move on with how genetics play into our management of certain breast cancers. We have uh, a question on the chat, and um, I want to encourage people to use the chat function if they have questions as they come up. What we'll do is we'll go through those questions at the end because I think some of what I'm going to say is going to uh, answer some of these questions and some of the things that I'm going to say are going to end up leading to, to more questions. So um, at, at the time we are right now, what I'd like to do is just take a step back for people um, because um, People have to understand that the overwhelming, and again, this, this, this is a point that Kristen hit, the overwhelming majority of breast cancers are not hereditary breast cancers. As a matter of fact, the overwhelming majority of women who I see in my practice with breast cancer have actually no family history of breast cancer at all. Um, there is a, often a conversation that happens when I see a breast cancer patient for the first time and she's upset and she says, you know, this, this really was, I wasn't expecting this, this wasn't supposed to happen to me. I don't have any history of breast cancer in my family. And the, um, the answer to, to that, that, that I have is, um, and people are quite surprised that, that somewhere between seven or 10, seven or eight out of 10 patients that I see do not have any breast cancer in their family. And that is why when we're recommending mammograms and screening mammograms for women, the recommendation is not to have a mammogram or not based on your family history. Um, if you have a family history of breast cancer, if you, um, if you, especially if you have a family history of young women or premenopausal women in your family with breast cancer, you might have different recommendations as to where to start mam mammography. But um, we do mammographic screening in all patients over the age of 40, all women over the age of 40. And the reason for that is that the overwhelming majority of breast cancer, we really do not have an explanation for. Uh, they are the so-called sporadic cases. And there are, you know, uh, there, there will be articles that you'll appear in the news that will discuss maybe uh, certain lifestyle um, or um, dietary choices may impact uh, the risk of breast cancer for the individual person. But those risks, when added on to just being um, a woman between the ages of, say, 50 and 70 years old, the risks of additional uh, lifestyle um, um, risks are, are, are minimal. 
Um, really, the idea is that the number one risk factor for breast cancer is being a woman between the age of 50 and 70 years old. And so that brings me to another point that I typically make with people is that as human beings, um, we, we were really not meant <laughs> to live this long. Um, if, if we really think about the history of human evolution, uh, it, whether or not you believe that human beings have been on this earth for somewhere between 150,000, maybe 200,000 years, okay? That's a long time, okay? For 99.9% .9 of that period of time, human beings lived and died before they even hit 40 years of age on average. Um, and the number one risk factor for women, um, for the death of women, for 99.9% .9 of that time was childbirth. So um, up until modern obstetric care and modern um, care of our uh, local environment, meaning our water quality, our, um, our waste, uh, up until the turn of the 20th century, that was really the, um, the way human beings lived for 100,000 to 200,000 years. So we are in uncharted territory. We're seeing um, people live and live well into their 80s and 90s. Um, and it's been said that the first person who's going to live to 150 years old, 150 years old, has already been born. So as we get better with our medical care and we get better with nutrition overall, um, and, and we get better taking care of diseases like cardiovascular disease, um, and things like that, we are going to see people live longer and longer, and hence we're going to see more sporadic cases of, uh, of cancer and more sporadic cases of breast cancer. Because our genes, when you get down to it, um, are a miracle, okay? Every cell in our body has the same blueprint inside of it, and it uses different um, parts of that blueprint, depending on what kind of function that cell has to have. So, but every cell has the same blueprint, has all the blueprints for what makes us us. And over the period of time of our lives, uh, that blueprint has to be made into photocopies and photocopies and photocopies of photocopies of photocopies of photocopies of photocopies. Of photocopies. And we have um, uh, really a miracle of machinery inside of ourselves to keep the integrity and the fidelity of that process together. And it's quite frankly, um, not really well understood why there aren't more mutations that occur in the average person over time. Um, but when we see cancers, whether they're breast cancer or another kind of cancer, what it is is that something has gone wrong in that process. Something has gone wrong in the blueprint. And we have the tools to fix it, thankfully. So when we look at, and I'm, I'm going to share my screen for a second, so sort of complementing what um, Kristen had talked about. Um, we looked, uh, there was a panel of uh, people that were put together, a panel of doctors that were put together. Uh, that were breast cancer specialists in the areas of surgery and radiation, which is what I do, and medical oncology. And this was put together by the American Society of Clinical Oncology and Radiation Oncology. And these are the two largest groups of cancer physicians in the United States. And I happen to be um, honored to be a part of that panel uh, with all of these other doctors from around the country. And the idea was to put together some recommendations for how we approach women who have certain genes that make them susceptible to breast cancer. And um, as you can see in uh, this article, it mainly focused on BRCA1 or 2, but also some of the other um, genes that Kristen had talked about. Um, this was uh, a project that represented about two years of work. Um, it was published in the largest oncology journal in this spring. And really the intent of it was 
to bring people together and to rake through the medical literature and to find out what the best pathway forward was for women who have these different genetic abnormalities, for women who don't have sporadic breast cancer, but they have a hereditary breast cancer, and how the treatment of sporadic breast cancers and hereditary breast cancers line up in some instances and how they might differ. There was a lot of myth um, out there about um, how different hereditary breast cancers might need to be treated. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I would say, inconsistency in how these cancers were treated across the country uh, by different physicians, mainly based on experience and mainly based on the rapid um, changing in the medical literature, which was very difficult for people to sift through. So when we sort of look through the existing literature in the country, what we basically look at is three particular things. And these are the three things that um, when someone comes with and is diagnosed with a hereditary breast cancer, they really want to know about. Number one, um, are my choices for surgery um, any different? In, in other words, there was a kind of this growing um, feeling across uh, the country that if you have a genetic breast cancer or hereditary breast cancer, you have to have um, not only a mastectomy for that breast cancer, but also a double mastectomy. And it's not necessarily the case. Um, although that's what many people opt for, um, one of the questions to the panel was, is it a reasonable choice for women with these um, hereditary breast cancers to undergo breast conserving therapy, meaning a lumpectomy? Um, and is it mandatory that they have to have um, both breasts removed? And what we found in the literature is that it's very, very reasonable, and there's a lot of experience out there in terms of treating patients with a lumpectomy for um, a hereditary breast cancer. Um, and in terms of treating patients without having to do a double mastectomy. So the panel concluded that it was a reasonable choice for women to choose that pathway if they wanted to. Um, now, that being said, it comes with um, trade-offs because um, women who have hereditary breast cancers and are diagnosed with that first breast cancer are also at a higher risk for having a second breast cancer, both on the side where they had their original diagnosis and on the opposite side. And so they have to undergo, if they choose to not undergo a double mastectomy, then the panel recommended that they have to have close um, surveillance with both mammography and MRI every year. Now you might say, well, why would anyone want to do that? Well, there are a number of different reasons. Um, there, there are, we see, and I've seen in my practice, women who have one of these um, genetic uh, breast cancers that um, wants to have more children and wants to breastfeed and, and wants to know about whether that's a reasonable um, thing to do uh, in the course of her life and her childbearing years. So there are, you know, there are reasons like that. There are other reasons that some women on the other end of that spectrum may be um, older and may, um, may, may have uh, trouble with um, the, the larger uh, ordeal that a mastectomy or a double mastectomy might mean to her in terms of her quality of life. So there's a number of different reasons, but the panel found that it was very reasonable to undergo um, a lumpectomy or um, um, not undergo a double mastectomy if you could closely uh, watch uh, for the development of future breast cancer. So that's number one. Number two is when women would choose um, different uh, surgical options with the mastectomy, there was, there was a question as to whether women with hereditary breast cancers could undergo reconstruction or could undergo um, different kinds of mastectomies like um, with newer techniques like nipple sparing mastectomies. Uh, 
And the panel found that um, if you met the same criteria as a sporadic breast cancer patient, that yes, you can undergo reconstruction and you can undergo nipple sparing mastectomy if that's the way uh, that you want to go as a patient. So that was a positive thing. Then we get into uh, radiation, which is what I do. And there were two main um, questions that uh, kept coming up in both the medical literature and in our conversations with patients. And that is, number one, um, do women who have genes that, that, or genetic mutations that put them at risk for breast cancer, women with a hereditary breast cancer, do they have any additional side effects from radiation therapy? That's number one. And number two is, do these same women have any additional risk of cancer in the future if they undergo uh, radiation treatment? So are, this, are there side effects that are worse? And number two, are there other risks of future cancers any worse in someone like this who undergoes um, breast cancer, uh, breast cancer treatment and radiation? So uh, th what the panel found again with the literature search was again encouraging. So number one, if you have a hereditary breast cancer and if you need to have radiation therapy, and many women don't need to have radiation, especially if they undergo a mastectomy, but there are some women who do. Number one is that the panel found that most women with uh, genetic breast cancer, especially BRCA1 and 2, have no additional side effects to radiation therapy, which is great. Um, there are some more rare, um, or not only more rare, but also a lesser completely understood genetic um, uh, mutations, such as those with ATM and uh, P53, where the risks of radiation side effects may be a bit higher in ATM, um, and the risks of radiation side effects are actually definitely higher in patients with a P53 mutation, which is also called Lee-Farmani syndrome. Um, so that's good to know that the majority of uh, patients, especially BRCA1 or 2 carriers, don't have those risks. And, and we also know the people who do. Number two is the panel found that there didn't seem to be any additional risk of additional cancers down the line from uh, undergoing radiation. Obviously, um, many people will ask me, well, you know, doesn't radiation cause cancer? And it's, it's a paradox that uh, we use radiation to treat cancer. And yet when you, in the popular uh, culture and we see movies and we've heard news articles about um, radiation causing cancer, and both of those things are true. What I tell people is that on an individual basis, radiation is helpful to treating particular cancers, either as a complement to surgery or as uh, a treatment on its own. Um, and the risks of radiation causing a cancer in the average person are minimal. We're talking less than one in 10,000 to less than one in 40,000 in the individual. On a population basis though, if we look at that one in 10,000 or one in 40,000 number, when we're talking about populations, that are exposed to radiation, um, that number then becomes significant. Because if you have a population, let's say in Japan, where they had the nuclear um, reactor meltdown from the uh, tsunami at Fukushima, you have about 8 million people crammed into a small space. And so if you look at that, say, one in 10,000 number, that number then starts to become significant. So we were worried about radiation causing cancer more on a population basis, not necessarily on an individual basis, individual risk, with the exception of those patients who have um, Lee Farmini syndrome, which is also a P53 mutation. They seem to have a higher susceptibility to cancers caused by radiation. So that's a good thing. And uh, then finally, number three is, should chemotherapy be any different in um, patients who have 
uh, genetic breast cancers like BRCA1 or 2. And um, generally speaking, in, in the cases of breast cancers that are caught early and are managed um, early, they are basically managed the same as sporadic cancers are. So if you need to have, let's say, hormonal therapy, because it's an estrogen or progesterone receptor positive breast cancer, and you're recommended to have tamoxifen or one of the sister drugs to tamoxifen, um, you should do so. Um, and there aren't any changes in that. And if you, in, if you are in need of having chemotherapy, the chemotherapy drugs are generally speaking the same. When we're talking about women who unfortunately have metastatic breast cancer who have, uh, which is sometimes referred to as stage four breast cancer, if they have a genetic um, susceptibility, a genetic breast cancer or hereditary breast cancer like BRCA1 or 2, there are some additional drugs that have been found to be effective in managing uh, those breast cancers. There are, there are other categories of drugs called the platinum Based drugs that are found to be actually very effective in this group of, uh, of people. So it's actually that you have an additional weapon in your arsenal uh, for the treatment of those patients. So all of these things were kind of distilled out into this uh, very important article that came out and um, really sh shined a lot of light on a lot of the controversies and uncertainties in how to manage women with hereditary um, so with that, I wanted to uh, take a look at uh, some of the questions that we have, and um, I might uh, throw the first question back to Kristen, and there's a question that says, we have not yet determined all gene mutations for hereditary cancer, correct? Meaning you might not have any of the gene mutations currently known to cause breast cancer, yet still carry a mutation that causes breast cancer that's just currently unknown. Is this the correct thought? And I would say, yes, it is correct. And actually, I think I could answer that question in the next question sort of in the same response. Um, in terms of hereditary breast cancer, I like to think of all the genes as a pie. We think that BRCA1 and 2 probably account for two-thirds of the hereditary breast cancer pie. There's debate on that, but they account for most hereditary breast cancers, but not all. So what else makes up the other third of the pie? So number one, anyone who only had BRCA1 and 2 testing done in the past, and that was the standard of care for years, um, may want to consider doing more testing so that with a multi-gene panel, they could not only have BRCA1 and 2 retested again with a newer technology, but you could look at the other third of the pie. But also, yeah, there are probably genes out there that we don't know about yet that could be the cause of hereditary breast cancer in a family, or it may be that the technology still isn't good enough, or our understanding of the genes that we're currently testing may not be good enough to find a particular mutation. And the example um, I'll use is back when BRCA1 and 2 testing was first introduced back in the late 1990s, people were only looking at the sequence or the spelling of the code. And then a couple of years later, the testing started to incorporate looking for big um, structural changes that people who did the testing earlier, that kind of analysis of those genes wasn't done. Now it's standard. So not only could the technology get better, but the pool of genes that we know seems to keep expanding. Great. And uh, thank you so much for that uh, clarity. And, and I think that um, those of us who were on the uh, project uh, for the treatment of these cancers recognized that this is going to be, these guidelines are really going to need to be updated every couple of years because, you know, the, the um, progress that we're making in uh, genetics overall and, and in our understanding of certain genetic breast cancers is just uh, changing so quickly. And so we all recognize that while this was a 
first um, set of guidelines for the treatment of breast cancers, that really what we were setting up is an infrastructure of how to come back and revisit these questions and add to our understanding over time and have them evolve. So um, that also leads into the next uh, question, uh, which is um, from um, one of our viewers. Uh, my sister at age 58 was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer and found out that she had a check two mutation. I was tested and do have the check two. At 59, I was diagnosed with DCIS could I also get triple negative breast cancer? No breast cancer in our family at all, except for the two of us. So um, I would say that uh, from my perspective, uh, when, when we're looking at this from a medical understanding of what to do um, and, and what to predict in the future, we, we, we did break down um, the recommendations into BRCA1 or 2, and then what, what we call moderate penetration genes. And these are like um, CHECK2, PALB. Um, these are genes where our understanding of how they penetrate and how they affect uh, the individual is, is still evolving uh, compared to BRCA1 or 2. Um, that being said, um, the, the lifetime, so, so the lifetime risk of, like, let's say, somebody with um, BRCA1 or 2 is somewhere around 70% of breast cancer, and it can be up to 90%. Um, with BRCA, excuse me, with CHECK2 and ATM and PALB, there's somewhere a little bit less, like around 30%, and we don't necessarily have as much understanding in the medical literature as to your specific question, which is, once you have the diagnosis of cancer, then what is your subsequent lifetime risk? I and mean, that depends on a lot of things, age being the most important one. And if you're diagnosed with one of these genes and a breast cancer in the premenopausal years, your lifetime risk of breast cancer is, is greater than if you were diagnosed at say 65. This individual asked this question sort of in the middle um, at age 59. There doesn't seem to be the kind of association with triple negative breast cancer and CHECK2 and PALB2 as there is with triple negative breast cancer and um, BRCA1 and 2. We don't really have that type of association that we see in the other ones yet, but um, that being said, uh, our understanding continues to evolve. And um, it's important to know that what I discussed in terms of treatment options applies to both the BRCA1 and 2 population and to these moderate penetration genes. So someone with a CHECK2 um, mutation is eligible for a lumpectomy, for DCIS, is eligible for advanced surveillance with MRI and mammography, but would also be eligible for uh, a single or double mastectomy. It's really based on her choice. So um, I hope that that's helpful. And um, then Another question that we have is uh, radiation for breast cancer. What tests are there that show if the cancer returned or has spread to other organs? Well, um, generally speaking, we um, don't advise, even in genetic breast cancer patients that they undergo um, routine head to toe scanning. Um, scans uh, are basically used um, in breast cancer patients uh, to follow or resolve symptoms that they have. So if you have some sort of new problem or symptom, then a scan is directed toward that. Um, but generally speaking, outside of advanced uh, cancers, we don't routinely use just sort of like scanning every, say, three to six months outside of the area of the breasts. Um, This one I'm gonna kick back to uh, Kristen. Uh, would you suggest all women get tested for hereditary cancer regardless of family history? That's a fun question. <laughs> so, um, so, well, I'll use me as an example. I've been a genetic counselor for over 20 years and most of that time has been spent um, doing hereditary cancer genetic counseling and I've never actually had that test 
because my family history didn't warrant it. Um, we have other problems. So um, there's some debate over whether or not women, regardless of their personal or family history of cancer, should they be tested for the, at least the BRCA1 and 2 genes. So there is a school of thought out there where some people say yes and other people say no. That's a really tricky one. Um, I'm, you know, I personally am not there yet. I could see how down the road that may be something that comes to pass, um, but there's a lot that would really have to be worked out for that to make sense on a general population basis. However, with breast cancer in particular, there is a growing school of thought that anyone newly diagnosed with a breast cancer, um, at least some of these high penetrance genes like BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, some of these, high, you know, TP53, some of these higher penetrance genes that may alter their care should be considered for patients. So, you know, it's, it's a, like I said, it's a fun question. There's no right answer, but that's sort of the, the kinds of things that people are thinking about right now. Okay, um, and uh, let me see, we, we're sort of short on time, so let me cherry pick a couple of uh, questions. Here's one for you, uh, Kristen. I was tested six years ago. Should I be retested? Have there been significant enough changes in the last six years to warrant repeat genetic testing? Right. Around 2013, 2014, 2015, when people were tested right in that window, it's really difficult to know what was included in their testing. A lot of people at that time for hereditary breast cancer were still getting just BRCA1 and 2, maybe one other gene, um, if it looked appropriate based on the family history. Um, but multi-gene panels were starting to come into play at that point. Um, and so to answer that question well, I would need to know what that person was tested for, but I would recommend that whoever tested you six years ago, you may want to go back to them and have them review your report, see what genes were tested, get an update of your family and personal history, and see if more testing would be warranted. But it's specific to the person and exactly what tests they had. Okay, and then I have two questions that I'm going to kind of combine together to answer. Um, one question was, would someone with hereditary breast cancer need to be treated with a traditional long course of radiation or are they candidate for a shortened course of radiation? And, and many people uh, do, um, I'm sorry, uh, many people do uh, ask that question when they come in to see because they've heard about shorter courses of radiation that have evolved over the last uh, 10 years uh, and those um, patients who have uh, genetic, uh, uh, underlying genetic um, abnormalities, they are totally uh, okay to be treated with shorter courses of radiation. Um, shorter courses of radiation actually bring the uh, side effects to radiation down and uh, theoretically put people at a lower risk for both short and long-term side effects. So um, we were happy to, to say that that's okay. And uh, number two, was uh, someone who's an ATM carrier and wants to know about screenings. Um, yes, I do agree that um, the optimal um, rotation is to do a mammogram once a year and then do an MRI on the other side of the year so that you're getting uh, alternating those screenings every six months and that would be the same for an ATM. Have I had lots of ATM carriers in my practice? I, I have had a few. Um, more than a few, but we have to realize that ATM and PAL B2, PALB2 and CHECK2 are all in this moderate penetrance uh, genetic uh, breast cancer group. They only make up about four to five percent of all breast cancer, so it's still rare that that entire group does. Um, but yes, I have uh, treated patients uh, like that. And then this final one, I'm going to kick back to Kristen, and this is really important. At Cooper University Hospital, is there a contact for someone who can look at, analyze, and report on findings from previous gene testing? Right. So the Cancer Genetics Program, which I am a part of, um, we can see people in our program, if they've done genetic testing, 
somewhere else and they want to come in and have a consultation, we would, you know, take a personal and family history, look at the previous genetic test report that the person comes in and try to explain the results um, because sometimes people still haven't gotten a good explanation of the results. What testing was done, what does it mean, and consider whether or not more testing would be recommended. Similarly, there was a question a little further back that talked about um, chemo prevention, the idea of someone taking a medicine to lower risk of breast cancer. That's also a service that we provide within the cancer genetics program that someone can come in and talk with us. Again, consider gene testing. If gene testing has already been done and it's negative, we can, with, in conjunction with the physician or an APN, an advanced practice nurse, think about whether or not a medication might be useful for that, that person's particular situation to determine whether, you know, that's something that could reduce risk. 